Um, I'm an artist, and um, you know, one of the things that I really want out of art, what I see the job of the artist to be is to try to learn how to see the historical moment that you find yourself living in, right? I mean that very simply, and I mean that very literally. How do you see the world around you? And this is harder to do than it might seem in many times. The world around us is a complicated place. There's all kinds of structures and forms of power that are very much a part of our everyday lives that we rarely notice. Watch what you say or do around your Amazon Echo or Google Home. A local consumer group warns that down the road, those digital personal assistants may be assisting their corporate creators hmm. more than they assist you. And one of the things I've been working on for 15 years or so is looking at the world of sensing, looking at the world of, you know, looking at the kind of planetary scale structures that we've been building that facilitate telecommunications, but at the same time are also instruments of mass surveillance. Okay, Google, turn on the hall lights. Your personal assistants named Alexa or Google. Alexa, ask Pizza Hut to place an order. Okay. May talk to you through these smart gadgets. What would you like to order? But Amazon and Google say their devices don't begin listening until you say a specific word like Alexa or Hey Google. When we talk about surveillance, I think a lot of us have the idea, oh, there's the security cameras and then there's somebody standing behind you know, all the monitors and looking and seeing what's going on. That image is over. It doesn't work anymore. Right now, the cameras themselves are doing the operations. In other words, you have a traffic camera, that camera can detect if somebody is you know, doing something wrong and automatically issue a ticket, right? So we're building these autonomous um, surveillance systems that actually intervene in the world. And a lot of people are saying that like by 2020, there'll be a trillion sensors on the surface of the earth that are able, that are able to do this kind of thing. So this is something that's very much transforming not only the surface of the earth, but our everyday lives as well. Becoming a dominant source for information too. Audio technology like Google Home and Amazon's Alexa are standing by to answer any of your questions. But tonight, one of the most common names is unknown to Google Home. What it tells you when you ask about Jesus. One of the most popular Christmas gifts this year, voice activated Google Home. Comments, videos, and test results posted asking who is Jesus. The general response from Google Home is, I'm not sure how to help you with that. Still no response from the Google company on why. Okay, Google, who is Jesus? My apologies, I don't understand. Google Home refers to Jesus Christ when asking about the Last Supper and even St. Peter. And there's plenty of information on the prophet Muhammad, Buddha, even Satan. They took prayer out of schools. They just think that uh, taking Jesus out of everything is politically correct these days. And I think that's the stem of a lot of our problems. Martin Collins has no doubt Google has purposefully programmed Jesus out of its audio speakers. Keep from stepping on toes, politically correctness. I mean, that seems to be the thing these days more than just what's right and what's wrong. Sam's calling for answers from Google as it's become a main source of information readily available that so many are becoming to depend on. When we look at what these planetary infrastructures look like, we, on the left we see an image of what Google's global infrastructure looks like. On the right, we see the National Security Agency's global infrastructure as of 2013. The point is, these are literally technological systems that envelop the Earth. Now, when we're talking about planetary surveillance systems, a aka planetary telecommunication systems, they're not only enveloping the Earth, like in series of cables and hardware and infrastructure, they're also in the skies above our heads. Every minute of every hour, there are hundreds and hundreds of satellites over our heads. One project I've been doing, again, over many, many years, is trying to track and photograph all of the secret satellites in orbit around the planet, all the unacknowledged um, satellites. And this is done using data from amateur astronomers. Amateur astronomers go out, they see something in the sky, they look it up in a catalog, it's not there. They know they've seen a secret satellite usually an American military or intelligence satellite. They write down what they saw. What I can do is I can take that observation, model that orbit, and then go out at night, model the orbit, make a prediction about where something will be, and then using telescopes and kind of computer-guided mounts, I can pinpoint a place in the sky where I think it'll be. And if you do everything right, which is rare, you get an image like this. 
and this line here is the streak of something called the X-37B, for example. This is an American secret space drone that's currently on its fourth mission, the X-37B. So I get into the culture a little bit of these things. This is, the, I found the crew patch, of the guys that fly this thing. And this is the program office that controls it, an outfit called the Rapid Capabilities Office, who have this motto here in Latin, opus dei, blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> doing God's work with other people's money. So this is kind of a, a glimpse into the, the culture of this kind of stuff. Um, so the point is, like, we have surveillance systems that exist at the scale of the planet that literally envelop the surface of the Earth and literally envelop the heavens above the Earth. But these scale down in various ways. These are also articulated, of course, at the scales of cities, down to the scales of living rooms, down to the scales of our bodies, down to the scales even of our thoughts and the questions that we ask. Consumer Watchdog released a report that suggests the companies may be planning on listening and watching in the future without you even noticing. Consumer Watchdog President Jamie Court points to patent applications by Google and Amazon that may show future uses of these devices. Watch this unexpected moment during our interview when Alexa seems to respond to what Jamie Court is saying. Clearly, Google Home and you know Amazon, uh, uh, Amazon with uh, with Alexa anticipate surveilling you and watching your family. I don't know that. That's very creepy. <laughs> Google and Amazon have not replied to our request for a response. I even asked Google who was David Sam's. Google knew who I was. But Google did not know who Jesus was. Google did not know who Jesus Christ was. And Google did not know who God was. Smart speakers are a technology owned by about 40 million Americans. That's about one in six. That's pretty scary. It's, it's almost like Google has taken uh, Jesus and God out of smart audio. First it started with schools. Sorry, I don't understand. There you go. See? She still doesn't understand. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't think, know if there's a wizard over there at Google who's making these decisions or if it's some kind of oversight. But it's definitely something that they need to address and address immediately. We're at a point now where Google or a Facebook or an Amazon literally knows more about me and my history than I know about myself. And what are some of the implications of that? How do we think through that? What does that mean? What do we see when we actually look through these kinds of sensing systems? Well, one thing that I think becomes very obvious when you spend some time with it is I think there's a kind of popular idea out there that, oh, technology is neutral. It's just how you use it. And I want to counter that. I want to say there's no such thing as technology detached from how you use it. And so when you use it, and when you deploy these kinds of systems, any kind of sensing technology sees through the eyes of the forms of power that is designed to amplify, the forms of power that is designed to exercise, whether that is military power or law enforcement or uh, commercial power, etc. I think that's one thing that you start to see. And this brings up a lot of concerns for me. I worry about what the future of these kind of planetary autonomous sensing systems are. I worry that they have a tendency to kind of reproduce the kinds of racism and patriarchy and inequality that have characterized so much of human history. And I'm also concerned that they represent enormous concentrations of power in very few places. And so one project that I've been doing is just trying to go to the places where these systems come together. Where does this in infrastructure kind of congeal in very specific places? A really important part of global telecommunications is choke points, places where uh, transcontinental fiber optic cables come together. What are the places where the continents are connected to one another? These are really important to telecommunications, but also obviously very important to surveillance. You sit on these places, you can collect most of the data that's going through uh, the Earth's uh, telecommunication systems. What do these look like? Well, this is a place in Long Island, one of these sites, one in Northern California at Point Arena, the west coast of Hawaii, Guam is really important to this kind of thing, Marseille in France. And what do you see in the image? Nothing. Right? The point of these images is these are some of like the most surveilled places on Earth. These are literally kind of like core parts of global telecommunications and surveillance infrastructure. There's no evidence whatsoever that that's going on in the photos of these kind of places. So what does that tell us kind of allegorically about how some of these infrastructures and systems work? 
I did start pushing this a little bit further. I wanted to say, well, theoretically, there should be these conjunctions of cables in, the, in these bodies of water in these images. And so I learned how to scuba dive in a swimming pool in uh, suburban Berlin, as you do, and started going out and studying nautical charts and undersea maps to try to find places on the continental shelf where I could maybe see these. Going out with teams of divers, when you do everything right, you find images like this. As you can see, there's dozens and dozens of internet cables across, moving across the floor of the ocean. These are cables that connect the east coast of the United States to Europe. A uh, phenomenon that's been going on for a while is um, ALPR, automatic license plate tracking. These are systems that take pictures of every single car that drives by um, on a city street, something like that is able to autonomously read the number of that car and either put that in a database that the police or law enforcement have access to or again issue things like traffic citations based on that, all without human intervention. The same thing is starting to come online with police body cameras, which are now being outfitted with facial recognition technology to do something similar. One of the tools that we have in the studio is the ability to make portraits of people, of what people look like as they are seen by facial recognition software. And we've been running these on portraits of revolutionaries and philosophers from the past. On the left is the great post-colonial philosopher Frantz Fanon, as seen through facial recognition software. On the right is Simone Weil. This is also obviously happening in the commercial space. You go to a modern supermarket, there are autonomous systems identifying you, trying to understand when the last time you were there was, how much money you spent, what are you looking at, what's your emotional state, what are you interested in? And they're getting more and more intimate, sensing systems looking at what kind of food do we eat? Are we going to the gym? You know, are we in good health? How are we behaving? Are we drinking too much? Do we smoke cigarettes? What kind of objects are in our houses and what does that say about who we are? By one Google service can be shared with its other platforms, allowing the company to build unprecedented profiles of users who sign into its services. So, are the changes good news for consumers or just a massive invasion of online privacy? It's the ability of, of companies like Google to, to make predictions about all aspects of your personal life. And if um, we realise that Google have got the, the, the capability through the data that they gather to predict things like our political affiliations, our religious affiliations, our sexuality, that kind of thing, people start to get a lot more worried than when they just see an advert for the car that they were just looking at or the watch they were just looking at. Yeah, I mean, you're an expert in this. I mean, does it spook you? I, I, it terrifies me, is the, is the simple answer. I said at the beginning of the talk that one of the things I want out of art is things that help us see the historical moment that we live in. How do we learn to see the world? But there's something else that I want out of art as well. I want something that helps us see a world that we want to live in. And if you want to see that world, you have to ask yourself, what do you want? And so I spend a lot of time looking at these technologies and asking myself, how would I want them to be different? What world do I want to live in?